Today we're going to talk about today we're going to talk about Riemann sums and definite integrals. But first, we're going to start out by talking about estimating the area under a curve. So the general idea here is we're going to estimate an area under a curve f of x. Um, so over some interval, so you've got yourself a function. Let's say our interval is a, b, and our function does something like that. You know, between the endpoints here, nice continuous function, well-behaved thing. Uh, so the idea here is we're going to divide the area up into thin rectangles, add up the area of those individual rectangles, because it's relatively easy to calculate the area of a rectangle, whereas the exact area underneath this curve between this curve and the x-axis is pretty complicated to figure out. But, you know, if we could turn this into a bunch of rectangles, well, we can find the, the areas of rectangles relatively easily and sort of get a pretty good estimate there. Um, yada, yada, yada. So once, you, once you've got that idea to get a true actual exact answer for the area of these rectangles, we could say, well, we could do better if we took thinner and thinner slices. And so just take more rectangles and you're not going to have these little area, like errors, chunks of area being included. Eventually, if you let there be an infinitely thin combination of rectangles in here, you're adding up rectangles that are so thin that there's absolutely no error in there and you get the actual exact answer. But before we do that, we got to start by talking a little bit about summation notation. So summation notation is uh, it's shown with a capital sigma. And here is what it looks like. So summation notation, capital Greek sigma here, sigma, often referred to as a sum or summation sign. And so it's typical to start writing i equals 0 on the bottom. and that. That, what that is going to be is that your starting index, and we're going to do some examples of this, and then you have n being up top an ending index. These variables aren't special. You could use whatever variable like, but it's common to use n on the top or m, and uh, n and m for your ending, and i and j and k for common starting index indices here. And then, well, if this says to add up a bunch of stuff, you have to tell yourself what you're going to add up. And so you're going to have like some math rule. And you know, f of x, i, in our case, it's going to be a function evaluated at individual inputs. The index is going to change the input. So I'll put x sub i in there to show that we're doing this. But really what this is, these are the terms to be added or summed. That's what summation notation is. So for example, let's let's do an example. Let's sum uh, f of x equals x to the third power over the integers from 1 to 10. And so what would this look like? Well, we'd write our sum symbol, and our starting index is i equals integers. So integers, fancy name for nice numbers, whole numbers, positive and negative. And we want to go from 1 until 10. So starting index on the bottom, i, the variable of index that's going to increase. How do we turn x to the third into something in terms of i, well, what's going to increase? We want the, the input of x to increase, so we could just write this as i to the third power. So we're going to have our starting index at i equals 1, and that's going to be 1 to the third power. And then you just increment up by 1, because we're working with integer, integers. Uh, yeah, And your indices are always going to be the positive integers. You're just going to go up by 1. You're never going to go up by a half or something like that. So you get 2 to the third. And then when i is 3, you get 3 to the third. And then you would keep going until you got up to 9 to the third when i was equal to 9. And then i equal to 10, your index getting to the stopping point, its ending value of 10 there, you have your last term to be summed. Uh, you fire up the internet or you do some maths and you see that that is 3,000. 25. But that actual answer is beside the point. Really, that was meant to be an example of what is summation notation and how could we work with it. Summation notation has some nice properties. Um, so let a sub i and b sub i be sequences of terms that we're going to add, and c be any constant number. Um, and then for any positive integer, any ending index n, if you are adding together the same number repeatedly, so summing a constant repeatedly, c is just a number, right? Well, if you, for example, if c was 3, uh, poor choice here, if c was 4, and we wanted to sum from i equals 1 to 3, well, we would just i equals 1. There's no i in here, so it's just 4. 
we're summing up the constant number 4. i equals 2, add 4 again. i equals 3, add 4 again. i equals, uh, and that's where we're going to stop, because 3 was our ending index. So i equals 3. And we say, hey, that's 12. But notice, that's really just 3 times 4 is 12. That'll always work. If you're summing up a constant number from 1 to n, uh, you just multiply n by that constant. After all, uh, multiplication is just repeated addition. And if you repeatedly add the same number, the number of times you're going to add it is the ending index, so n times c. You can also factor out a constant. And in this case, I'm using the word factoring appropriately. We are actually doing a factoring here. Um, so say our index a, our, our sequence ai is um, something like the even numbers, 2, 4, 6, et cetera, et cetera. And so what would this look like if we added some number c times that? Well, we would get c times 2 plus for i equals 1. And then because that's a sub i is, a sub 1 is 2. a sub 2 is 4. And then we would multiply by that, i equals 2. At each term, we would have c being multiplied out in front. You can continue this on. But check that out. You have the same factor being multiplied by every single term. Well, by the definition of factoring, we can pull out that c and just add the terms together. And that's what this rule says. You can factor a constant through that's being multiplied, as long as it's just a number, by your sequence terms that are being added up, or the math expression. And then you can split them up over addition and subtraction. As long as you just have a finite stopping point here on top, and in Calc 2 you see that if that thing turns into an infinity, it gets to be significantly harder. But as long as you have a finite stopping point on top, you can absolutely split up across two rules. So if you had your first rule was i to the third like we had, and the second rule was twice i, which was actually, I didn't tell you that, but this is twice i would be the b sub i there. And then you could absolutely split this into two problems where the first one you dealt with the i third and the second one you split that. Those are just a few properties, the primary ones there. Summation notation is pretty nice. Okay, we're going to stop there.